Welcome to Science Class. Today, we are going to learn about another idea that Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace originally came up with, sexual selection. Alfred Russell Wallace? Yeah, I probably should have mentioned this earlier. Darwin began writing On the Origin of Species in 1837 and finished it in a few years. But he didn't publish it because he knew the book would be so controversial that he would likely suffer as a result from constant attacks, from his fellow intellectuals, and the public. But in 1858, Wallace, who was himself also a British naturalist, sent Darwin a paper outlining a theory Wallace had about life on Earth. Wallace had independently discovered natural selection. Darwin stated that Wallace came up with essentially the exact same idea as he had. Darwin and Wallace co-authored an official paper that was published later that year. And the following year, 1859, Darwin officially published the complete first issue of On the Origin of Species. Some of Darwin's fears about its publication came true. He was celebrated by many people who read his hypothesis with an open and uncorrupted mind, but he was attacked by vast numbers of other people. He suffered horrendous gastrointestinal problems the rest of his life, almost certainly due to stress. Back to the title of the video. It's no secret that as you look at the animal kingdom, there are remarkable differences between the sexes. A peacock and a peahen, or a rooster pheasant and a hen pheasant are very different. Male and female black widow spiders look so unalike that they don't even look like the same species. Along with looks, there are also the behaviors centered around mating and courtship. The evolutionary mechanism behind all of this is sexual selection. Let's get started. Sexual selection is an example of intraspecific competition, which is competition between members of the same species. In simplest terms, what happens during sexual selection is members of the same sex compete with each other for access to mates. The competing is almost exclusively done by males. We'll talk about why that is later. The general pattern we see in nature is that if males not only compete, but fight one another, then they basically inherit the right to mate with females. The dominant male lion in a pride simply mates with all of the females. His competition for mates ends when he beats his male rivals. This is an example of polygyny, where a male mates with several females. The best fights you can see in the animal kingdom are typically between polygynous males. Elephant seals, bighorn sheep, deer, lions, certain primate species, plus many more. Another general pattern that we see is if the males compete without fighting, then the females decide who they will mate with, and they are likely to mate with several males. This is an example of polyandry, where a female mates with more than one male. How do males compete without fighting? They show off. There is no shortage of hilarious footage of animal mating rituals. For whatever reason, the best dances and most ornate displays seem to come from birds. Just, just look at this ostrich dance. What is that? What is that supposed to convey? I have no idea, but for whatever reason, female ostriches find this irresistible. But courtship rituals are seen everywhere. Fish build displays and do their own little dances. Some species of spider do these adorable little dances, only to end up being killed and eaten by the female. In some species, the males fight and the females choose. Chinese ring-neck pheasants have a claw on their leg that males use for fighting, but they are also much more ornately decorated than the females. Typically, males who fight each other do not have ornate displays on hand as well but the pheasants are ornately displayed because the females also choose the males after they fight each other. No matter what kind of competition takes place, if a species does compete rigorously for mates, there's almost always a significant amount of what's called sexual dimorphism. This is the condition where the two sexes of the same species exhibit different characteristics beyond just their sex organs. In some species, the most significant difference is size, but in others, the phenotypes can be wildly different. 
The difference in sexual dimorphism between male and female tigers is so subtle that you can't really tell them apart, whereas in lions, it is highly distinct. Yet the difference in male and female lions is not as extreme as it is in mandrills, pheasants, many deer and ibex species, the black widow spiders, and more. So why is some sexual dimorphism slight to non-existent, while other forms of it are so extreme? This is not always the case, but in general, animals that partner for long periods of time, or perhaps for life, which we call monogamy, have very low sexual dimorphism. Male and female emperor penguins are extremely difficult to tell apart, and they mate for long periods of time, and they raise their chicks together. There is some sexual dimorphism among chimpanzees and bonobos, our closest relatives, but it isn't very noticeable. The reason for low sexual dimorphism in chimps and bonobos is different. In this case, what you have is a highly social species that is very promiscuous. And by promiscuous, I mean the males mate with several females and the females mate with several males. Because of this, males don't really have to fight to have a chance to pass on their genes. There's plenty of fish in the sea, you could say. Contrast that to their close relatives, the gorillas, who are polygynous and the males are much larger than females. Humans are weird. Western culture and many other cultures have structured themselves towards monogamy, and it works well enough, but it's not a perfect reflection of our biology. When psychologists do anonymous surveys of men and women, they always find massive differences in the way men and women respond. Men typically say they want to have somewhere around 18 partners in their lifetime, whereas women say they want around four or five. These results suggest a high degree of polygyny, but even in hunter-gatherer societies, polygamy exists, but it's not as common as the data suggests it would be. Human males and females are also relatively moderate in their degree of sexual dimorphism. The average male and average female are very similar across a huge number of dimensions. Size and strength are two of our largest differences. At a height of 178 centimeters, the male to female ratio in the population is around seven to one. But if you increase just to 182 centimeters, the ratio is closer to 2000 to one. That is the sort of thing you find when you have overlapping bell curves that are slightly offset. So if we want sexual selection to make sense, it has to be borne out by the evidence. So far, I've already covered the evidence in terms of behavior patterns of these animals. We will come back to behavior in a bit, but first we should answer the question of why do males bother to go through all this effort? Female pheasants blend in wonderfully with their environment, whereas male pheasants don't just advertise to females with their looks, they also advertise to predators. They stand out, which seems like a very dumb strategy for a prey animal. In the insect world, many females kill and devour the male after mating. Male anglerfish bite onto the female after mating, and their body and nutrients are slowly absorbed by the female. Fights between males of the same species commonly lead to death. Why do males play this most dangerous game? Well, it's all about the statistics. The odds of mating and passing on your genes only have to be slightly greater than your odds of dying in order for the strategy to be beneficial from the point of view of passing on your genes and carrying on the species. A careful consideration of the risks and rewards gained helps this make even more sense. While male pheasants do stand out, they are still able to hide effectively and they can fly. Yes, they are much more likely to die than females, but the risks pay off. Female roosters don't lay enough eggs for the male to consider mating one time a victory. So instead, the males are adapted to live long enough lives to mate several times. Whereas in the case of the mantis or spider, they are killed and eaten after mating. Sounds like a bad trade-off, but the females of these animals will lay several hundred eggs. Even if the male only mates once, he passes on so many copies of his genes that from the evolutionary perspective, he won the game. The last thing to talk about is why do females do the choosing? This is pretty straightforward. Females have fewer opportunities to reproduce, so they must maximize their opportunities 
to ensure they pass on the most successful traits. They can't afford to mate with a loser just because he's a really nice guy. Because animals live in tremendous danger all the time, what with parasites and predators and bad weather and food shortages. Also, more often than not, females bear most of the responsibility or all of the responsibility in raising the offspring, so they must make it worth their while in that respect too. The waddled jacana is one of very few species where the females compete for males, and in that species, the males are the ones who raise the offspring. We should also talk about the whole choosing aspect of this. Does a female bird of paradise really know why she's choosing a mate? Truth be told, the choosing is almost completely unconscious. So why does sexual selection of this type exist anyways? Well, it's like trying to answer why you like a certain food. Because it tastes good. Why does it taste good? I don't know, it just does. You don't have to know it for it to still be true. Many foods that taste bitter are actually poisonous. Now, do we know that they are poisonous? No, we just know that we don't like the way they taste and that works well enough. It turns out that behavior and genetics are highly linked, and many genes are also linked together with phenotype. It's not just that the male elk with the biggest antlers is the strongest male, he also very likely has the strongest immune system, the most favorable metabolism, and many other things. The phenotypes of these animals, such as the color pattern on a bird, are actually advertisements of their genetic strengths as well. Us humans, we do all kinds of ridiculous stuff to show off to one another, and quite a lot of it is dishonest. We dye our hair, we buy expensive looking things, we wear certain clothes, we walk and talk a certain way, all in an effort to advertise ourselves. But it's very manipulative and dishonest. It's very difficult for animals to lie. If a bird has a very dull feather pattern, it's almost certainly because he has bad genes and he won't be selected because females are wired genetically to not desire him. The female behavior is genetically linked to desire specific male phenotypes and those male phenotypes are linked to their other underlying genetic strengths. This protects the population in the long run. You gotta feel bad for those birds though. That does it for sexual selection. Next time we are going to discuss the fossil record and what it can tell us about evolution. Thanks for watching.